Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to review the latest mini PC from Mini's Forum. This one is called the HX90G, and this is part of what they call the Neptune series. They've released a similar device called the HX90 sometime last year. Now what makes this model unique is that it's the first one in a mini PC form factor that has its own dedicated graphics card. And when they asked me if I was interested in testing it, I said, yeah man, I want to do it. Now the pricing starts at $800 for the bare bone edition, but for an additional $100, you get one with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. That's the one I'm testing today. But for the purposes of this review, I'm just going to think of this device as a $900 PC. Now, like I mentioned, the big draw here is it has its own graphics card, the Radeon RX 6600M. This is a mobile chip with RDNA 2 architecture. And so in this video, we're going to see whether or not having that dedicated graphics card is going to make a big difference when it comes to gaming. And so without any further delay, let's check it out. Okay, as we usually do with the beginning of these videos, let's start with some specs. The CPU on this is a Ryzen 9 5900X with 8 cores and 16 threads. And as I mentioned before, the graphics card is an RX 6600M. It has two slots for M.2 storage, as well as two spaces for RAM sticks as well. Internally, it has Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 and a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. It also has four video output connections, two HDMI and two DisplayPort, all running 4K at 60 Hz. As far as ports, we have four 3 3.2 USB-A ports and then one USB-C port. Let's take a closer look here. As you can see, it has some carbon fiber accents. And on the front, we have one USB-A port, then headphone and microphone. And finally, the single USB-C and a power button. As far as ventilation and airflow, there's a lot here. For example, you can see there are two fans on the top and each of the sides are well ventilated also. On the back, we have three more of those USB-A ports, the two and a half gigabit ethernet port, then the dual display port and HDMI out. And of course the power supply in right here. Now looking at the bottom of the HX90G, you can see there are no visible screws, but if you pull off the rubber feet, you can see them right there. And that's always kind of annoying to have to pull off these screws, it doesn't make it quite as easy to access everything. To open it up, all you need is a guitar pick to unclip the bottom here. After that, you'll find there's another bracket inside which has four Phillips head screws as well. So now that we're actually inside the device, let's take a closer look. We'll start with the RAM. These are two 8GB sticks clocked at 3200 megahertz. Next, we have the Wi-Fi chip, which is Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. I thought it was kind of cool that the Wi-Fi chip and the SSD are held down by the same screw. As far as the SSD, you can see it's a Fizen brand here, 512 gigs. And here's that second M.2 slot if you wanted to add additional storage. I think it's kind of a shame that they didn't have a slot for a 2.5 inch SATA drive, but all the same, it is nice that there's at least expandable storage. Now as far as mini PCs goes, this one is pretty dang large. Up above it is the B550, also made by Mini's Forum, which to date was the largest one I had tested. And as you can see, the HX90G is quite a bit larger than even the B550. I've always considered the B550 to be about two and a half carry gold butters, but as you can see here, the HX90G is nearly five. In more practical terms, here it is compared to a typical Xbox controller. In even more practical terms, here's how it looks actually on my desk. And yeah, I would say this is actually a little bit too big for the space I have for it right here under my monitor. And so if space is a premium for you, you may not want to lay it on its side like this. Instead, you may be interested in using the stand that comes with the device. And this is pretty easy to put together. I think it was a total of maybe seven screws altogether, but yeah, here it is right here. To be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the stand itself. It just is a little bit weird that it is pointed at the front. It almost feels like it's supposed to be aerodynamic, but you would never want to use this in an aerodynamic way. So kudos to the company for coming up with a new design, but all the same, it looks a little bit tacky to me. Okay, because there's so much ventilation and fans with this, I did want to test out the thermal performance. You can see here at idle, it's running at about 43 degrees Celsius and the CPU power draws about five watts. So now let's turn on Cinebench and we'll see how loud the fan gets. I also moved the PC to the other side of the desk and as you can see, it doesn't take as much space when it's using the stand. Anyway, yeah, as you can see, the fan is almost inaudible. I had to really pump up the audio here just to be able to hear it. Now, when it came to thermal performance running Cinebench here, you can see that it was maxing out at about 82 degrees Celsius, and the power draw from the CPU was about 45 watts. In terms of the Cinebench score itself, it's actually pretty good, over 13,000 points. If you remember, a couple weeks ago, I reviewed this mini PC from Mini's forum called the NUC XI5. 
This one has an RTX 3060 graphics card inside, but the CPU is not as powerful. Here's the Cinebench score from that machine, about 9600 points. Now going back to the HX90G, here's the Time Spy score from 3D Mark. And it's getting a little bit over 8000, which seems to be pretty good performance, but when you compare that to the NUC XI5 we just looked at, you can see that the RTX 3060 does push it quite a bit further to a score of nearly 8500 points. Now I don't have a lot of other PCs to compare with, but I do have my original PC right here, which I mentioned in that previous video as well. Now since making that last video, I did upgrade the GPU on that to the RX 6650, so a little bit better than the one we're testing today. And as you can see, the score here is quite a bit better at about 9500 compared to the 8100 from the HX90G. So I think in the end, what it really comes down to is what form factor and size are going to work best for your needs. Meanwhile, if you're looking for something on a budget and you want it pre-built, then something like the UM580 might be a better fit. However, if you're looking for something that's pre-built with a dedicated graphics card that is also small, then really your only two choices of mini PCs right now are this HX90G as we're testing today and the NUC XI5, which we tested a couple weeks ago. Personally, when looking at them all lined up like this, I do think that the HX90G is the best looking among them. Not only does it pack a bunch of power inside, but the size is really not that much bigger than a typical mini PC, at least when you compare it to a full-size desktop like on the far right. Anyway, that's about all I had to say when it comes to the sizing of everything. Let's move on to actual gameplay performance. We're going to start with PC gaming, and I'm going to start at the middle tier and then just kind of work my way up from there. As you'll see throughout the video, I mostly tested everything at 1440p instead of 4K. I found that if I used a 1440p resolution, I could usually use high settings when it came to the graphics itself, and it was a better balance. Playing the games in 4K at medium settings just didn't look as good. Of course, if you wanted to try 1080p with really high settings, then you could definitely do that too. But for me personally, I thought this balance just looked a little bit better overall. Anyway, as you can see here, I'm mostly just capping everything with either V-Sync or a frame rate cap to 60 frames per second. But even then, at a 1440p resolution and high video settings, we were getting a pretty stable frame rate. The first time I started to see a little bit of dip was in Witcher 3. This one did drop down below 60 frames every once in a while, but was still a very playable and very enjoyable experience. If you don't want to have any dips at all, then you might want to drop it down to 1080p or medium settings at 1440p. Here's God of War with FSR off at 1440p and high settings. Unfortunately, this one did not stay at a stable 60 frames per second. There were often times when it would drop down to the low 50s, but still overall, I would think this is totally playable. Red Dead Redemption 2 also did pretty good at 60 frames per second at 1440p with high settings. I would say that I saw an average of about 58 or 59 frames per second, but man, that's very close to 60 if you ask me. And finally, I tested with Cyberpunk 2077. I used 1440p on the very high settings, but I did not use VSync. That allowed the frame rate to get well above 60, something around 75 to 80 was the average. And so yes, in a nutshell, when it comes to PC gaming, I think that 1440p is a pretty good standard. You may have to adjust it if you're going to try to play a AAA game, but for the most part, you should get away with this high resolution. Okay, moving over to retro game emulation, we're going to start with the high-end systems and just work our way up from there. Obviously, everything below, like PSP and Dreamcast and things like that, they're all going to play perfectly in 4K. And probably the best way to convince you they're going to work so well is to show you that GameCube also works really well at a 4K resolution. So we're playing everything at a 6x upscale, and as you can see, not a hiccup even in the hardest to play games, things like F-Zero GX or Rogue Squadron 2. And so yes, if you're looking for the ultimate GameCube machine, this might be it. A lot of mini PCs that don't have dedicated graphics cards can play GameCube at 1080p no problem, but I've never seen any that can play them at 4K. Moving forward, let's also try Nintendo Wii. Same Dolphin emulator here, same settings as well, a 6x resolution or a 4K. And as you can see, these games are all playing super smooth as well. So yes, when it comes to emulation in 4K, GameCube and Wii are perfect. Now moving forward to PS2, unfortunately this one didn't do so hot at a 6x resolution. Instead I found I had the best performance at a 4x resolution which is 1440p. And honestly I think this is just a better setting to use anyway when it came to the PCSX2 emulator. There probably are going to be some games that you can play at a 6x resolution, but just setting them to 4x at 1440p means that every game is going to play great and you don't have to worry about fiddling with the settings or anything else like that. 
And so my recommendation here would be to just set it to 1440p and then play through. And if you have a game that's playing really well, then that's probably the time to see whether or not it can play at something like a 6x resolution. But at the end of the day, I'm just super happy to be playing 1440p PS2 on a machine like this. It's super cool to be able to see God of War 2 or Champions of Norath playing at a high resolution. Now, unfortunately, I did not have good success doing a 4x resolution with the original Xbox, but 2x resolution worked just fine. And like I've mentioned before in some of my other videos, when it comes to Xbox emulation, it's not so much about performance, but compatibility. And so as long as you can find a game that works well with this emulator, you should have a pretty good time. Now, unfortunately, it's not all perfect at a 2x resolution. There were some games that I had to drop down to one. Forza Motorsport, as you can see here, is a good example. This one only played at full speed at a 1x resolution. Okay, let's move over to the next generation of consoles, starting with the Nintendo Wii U. And surprisingly, this one was very similar to the PS2 when it came to performance. What I found is that a 1440p resolution worked the best. And much like with PS2, it's at that sweet spot where all you have to do is set it to 1440p and then just start playing your games and everything is going to work well. And so if you want to play a lot of Wii U games and you want to have it in higher resolution than the native resolution, but you don't quite need 4K, then this might be a good fit. However, if you saw my Nuck XI 5 video from a couple weeks ago, a lot of these games played at 4K no problem. Even Breath of the Wild. Now for me personally, it's really hard to tell the difference between 1440p and 4k when I'm playing it, but if that's something that's critical to you when it comes to game emulation, you may want to check out that Nuckx video. The pricing for each of these is about the same, around $900, but the performance on the other PC was quite a bit better than it is here. That being said, 1440p Breath of the Wild is still pretty dang nice. Alright, let's move over to Nintendo Switch next. For this one, what I did is I went into the settings and I changed it to a 2x resolution. Depending on the native resolution of that game, that could mean that it's bumping it up to 1440p or 4k. Either way, as you can see here, a 2x resolution for most of these Switch games gets it very close to a stable 60 frames per second. There were definitely some dips here and there depending on the game and whether or not shaders were caching, but I think it's one of those cases where the longer you play, the better it's going to get. For example, with Link's Awakening, I found that it would dip down even sometimes into the 40s as I entered a new area. But once I started playing in that area for a little bit, absolutely no problems, it would bump back up to 60 frames. And so yes, if you're interested in Nintendo Switch emulation and you want it at a higher resolution, much like what we talked about with the Wii U, this might be a good fit. And finally, the last high-end emulation system I wanted to test was the PS3. And I found that with this machine, I actually got better PS3 performance than I did on the Nock X from a couple weeks ago. And that makes sense because PS3 likes to have lots of cores and threads, and this one has 8 cores and 16 threads. The Nuck XI 5, by comparison, only had 6 cores and 12. In fact, the PS3 performance was so good on this that I actually upscaled everything to a 1080p instead of the native 720. And while that did make some of the games look a lot better than before, some of them actually looked worse. Prince of Persia is a good example, I had lots of graphical anomalies. And I'm not really sure if this has to do with the GPU drivers, or just the fact that this game doesn't like to be upscaled. Either way, yes, other than these graphical anomalies, the PS3 performance on here was pretty great. Okay, and a couple other quick tests I wanted to do before wrapping up. First thing, I did verify that yes, Botticera works just fine on here. I have this loaded on an external USB drive, and I just plugged it in and then booted right into it, and as you can see, no problems. And so if you want to have a handy way of organizing your retro game collection, or even pushing it up to some of those higher emulators, this is going to work pretty good. However, given the fact that this is a $90 mini PC, I'm not really sure if that's going to be in your budget to have a dedicated Botticera machine for that price. Instead, I think it might be worth considering if you want to have a separate SSD that's dedicated to Botticera and then use the rest of the machine for more PC-oriented tasks. And so potentially you could use this as your daily driver PC with maybe some high-end video editing given the fact that it has that nice big Cinebench score. And then you could either game right on Windows or you could have a dedicated gaming system with a Botticera drive like this. Either way, you've got quite a lot of options and each of them are going to perform well. Another option is you could actually just boot into a Linux operating system. Here is Zorin OS, and I'm just using a test operating system here from a flash drive. But as you can see, yes, this works super good on Linux as well. And so yes, I think this expands your options even more. You've got two SSD slots, and then you could also boot with a USB drive. Okay, so that was my summary of PC gaming and retro emulation. Now let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the HX90G. 
To start, I like the size of this mini PC. It's a little bit bigger than your typical model, but all the same, it's still nice and compact. And I do think that for the most part, it looks pretty attractive as well. As we saw in the game testing, 1440p seems to be the standard on this machine. Even when you bump it up to the higher graphics settings, you can still get a stable 60 frames per second. And when it came to emulation, just about every single system could be upscaled at least to 2x or beyond. We also have a variety of operating systems that we can work with. In addition to Windows 11 Pro, which ships with the machine, we can also boot Linux operating systems like Bodicera or Zorin. I also really appreciate how quiet the HX90 G is. For example, during my testing, I had it sit right next to the M1 MacBook Pro that I use for most of my daily tasks. And what I found is that when either of them would kick in, I wasn't sure which one was which. And the MacBook Pro is known as being a very quiet laptop. The fact that we have a mini PC that's just as quiet is kind of cool. But of course, this is not a flawless machine, just like with anything else, so let's talk about what I don't like about it. Number one is the price. I think that at $900, this starts to feel like an investment. I've always found that the sweet spot when it comes to mini PCs is $500 or below. At those prices, you can usually get something that's super compact and has a variety of uses. Of course, you're going to be much more limited when it comes to performance, but because you're not paying as much, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. When it comes to this one, yes, you can definitely push that performance much further, but you are going to pay the price for that as well. It's kind of a strange concept, but for me, when I see a $350 mini PC that can play GameCube at 1080p, it's like super exciting. However, when I see something that costs about three times the price but can play 4K GameCube, I don't know, I'm just not as excited. And I think that has to do with the fact that at that price point of $900, you can start building your own PC. It won't be as small, but it'll definitely be as powerful, if not more so. However, at $350, it's almost impossible to build a PC that's gonna be good. Anyway, that was a big number one when it comes to things I don't like, let's move on. The other thing I don't like about it is that it only has a single USB-C port here on the front. I love the fact that the port is on the front because it makes it easy to access, but I'd also like to have one on the back so I can plug up a USB hub or something else like that. I also think it's a shame, given the size of this mini PC, that there wasn't space for a 2.5 inch drive as well. I appreciate that there are two M.2 slots, but all the same, 2.5 inch drives are much cheaper right now. And so by taking that extra mile, the consumer would have just benefited more from having a 2.5 inch drive slot. And finally, like I mentioned earlier in the video, I'm not a huge fan of the design of this stand itself. In my use case, it doesn't really matter because it's hidden behind my MacBook, but all the same, it just doesn't look very good. I'm not sure what they could have done to make it look any better, but honestly, this isn't it. But at the end of the day, I think the negatives here are kind of minor quibbles compared to the power and performance that we can get from this machine, especially given the small form factor. I'm super excited that we're starting to see mini PCs with dedicated graphics card because it opens up that whole space even more. But in my opinion, I think whether or not this PC is worth considering is going to be up to two different factors. Number one is going to be whether or not you're comfortable trying to build your own PC. Because for $900, you could definitely piece together something that's going to be quite a bit more powerful than this. And even then, if you don't want to build your own PC, you could buy a pre-built PC for about $900 that will probably be on par with this as well. But then that leads into the second factor of whether or not space is at a premium on your desk. Because yes, for $900 you could build a much better PC and potentially get a pre-built large PC for that same price too. But if you don't have the space for a full-size PC, then this is probably where this one is going to come into play. Because at that point, if you don't have the space for a large PC, you're going to be best served by something like a laptop or a mini PC like this one. And so at the end of the day, yes, this is a very good PC, it's just going to come down to whether or not it's a good fit for your specific needs. And I hope that this video at least helped you narrow it down to whether or not it's a good choice. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.